Now, as Catholics, you know that we are constantly being told that many tenets of our faith are not in the Bible that our faith contains man-made traditions that are opposed to God's Word, that we listen to the Pope instead of to the Bible, and so on and so on. How do we, as Catholics, respond to such charges? First, remember what I told you last week. If you don't know the answer to something, do not, I repeat, do not hesitate to say, I don't know. But, what do you say right after you say, I don't know? I will find out and get back to you. Wonderful. Secondly, know this. Let this fact be permanently imprinted on your psyches. The Bible is a Catholic book. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes, but it is a Catholic book. It's ours. The Catholic Church gave it to the world. And there is not a single article in the Catholic faith that is opposed to anything in the Bible. Not one. You may have heard people describe themselves as Bible Christians. Well, Catholics are Bible Christians. Foster confidence in you as a Catholic that your faith has the answers. Even, even if you don't have a particular answer right at the tip of your tongue at any given moment. There is an answer for whatever question you're being asked. I want you to be confident that any argument someone brings to you about the Catholic faith in the Bible has an answer. Now, let's take an example of a question you might hear about the Catholic faith in the Bible and see how we could answer it. You might hear something along these lines. If there really is such a thing as purgatory, as the Catholic Church teaches, then why doesn't the Bible ever mention the word purgatory? Now, how do you go about answering that question? You want, of course, to give them the scriptural basis for purgatory. There is one. And as I said, I'll give it in week four. But before you do that, you want to establish some principles first. And how do you establish these principles? By asking some questions of your own. So let's ask the question again. If there really is such a thing as purgatory as the Catholic Church teaches, then why doesn't the Bible ever mention the word purgatory? And remember, I'm using purgatory in this example, but you could be talking about the Immaculate Conception, the Pope, or anything else of that nature. When a non-Catholic asks you, where in the Bible it teaches this or that Catholic doctrine, in this instance purgatory, what is the underlying assumption of their question? Well, the underlying assumption of the question is that for something to be considered Christian, one should be able to find it directly in the Bible. That is a flawed assumption. Do not let that assumption go unchallenged. But how do you challenge it? by establishing the principle that not all Christian beliefs are found directly in the Bible. And how do you do that? By asking a question. You could ask the following very simple question of the person you're talking to. Do you believe in the Trinity? When they say yes, then you ask them, well, where in the Bible is the word Trinity? You know what? It's not there. So what you have just done, very quickly and very painlessly, is establish the principle that not everything that is to be believed by a Christian is directly mentioned in the Bible. Is there scriptural backing for the Trinity? Yes. Of course. Just like there is scriptural backing for the doctrine of purgatory. But the word Trinity, just like the word purgatory, is not found anywhere in Scripture. So by establishing this principle, you've just taken a little of the steam, a little bit, out of their arguments. But before getting back to answering the question about purgatory, you need to do something else. You need to establish another principle. You need to ask them why they assume that everything about the Christian faith has to be found in the Bible. This assumption, or rather this doctrine, 
that everything Christians believe has to be found in the Bible is called sola scriptura, which is Latin for the Bible alone. As Catholics, we need to be constantly asking the question, is the Bible alone really the sole rule of faith for Christians? Does it really contain everything we need to know about faith and morals? Most believe this doctrine. In other words, they believe that the Bible is the only thing we need in order to know and to believe all that Jesus wanted us to know and believe regarding the Christian faith. And this doctrine of the Bible as the sole rule of faith, sola scriptura, is one of the two main pillars of Protestantism. The other is the doctrine of sola fide, or salvation by faith alone. And as I said, we'll talk about that some next week. But if you can establish the principle that sola scriptura is not a scriptural principle, or at least cast some doubt on it, then you have come a long way in defending what your church teaches. So how do we establish the principle that sola scriptura, the Bible alone, is the sole rule of faith for Christians, is not a scriptural doctrine? We ask a question. To establish a principle, you ask a question. This is what I do. I hold up the Bible. I take my Bible, or if they have one, I ask them for theirs. I hold it up. I say, for a Christian, what is the pillar and bulwark of the truth? And for those of you who don't know, a bulwark, according to my dictionary, is something that acts as a protection or defense. So I point to the Bible I'm holding, and I say, for a Christian, what is the pillar and bulwark of the truth? The Bible, right? Most Protestants, particularly evangelicals and fundamentalists, will say, well, of course it's the Bible. That's when I open their, their Bible to 1 Timothy 3.15. Go ahead and open yours there. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Get used to finding this verse because it's a very important one, one which you will use over and over. In the first letter of Timothy, chapter 3, verse 15. And what does 1 Timothy 3.15 say? If I am delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and bulwark of the truth. So it is the church, not the Bible, that is the pillar and bulwark of the truth. So the church is a pillar of truth. What does a pillar do? It holds things up. So the Bible is telling us that the church is upholding the truth. It's a pillar of the truth. And the church is a bulwark of the truth. What does a bulwark do? As I said a moment ago, a bulwark is something that acts as a protection or defense. So the Bible is telling us that the church is protecting and defending the truth. Sola Scriptura? I don't think so. Scripture says, the Bible says, the Word of God says, not that the Bible is the pillar and bulwark of the truth, but that the church, the church is the pillar and bulwark of the truth. Now, after pointing out this passage of Scripture, ask the following question. Follow up with this question. If the church is the pillar and bulwark of the truth, the upholder and defender of the truth, then aren't we, as Catholics, right to listen to the church in matters of faith and morals? About purgatory, or Mary, or the Pope? And particularly, shouldn't we listen to the church in matters pertaining to the proper interpretation of Scripture? You have just established the principle that sola scriptura cannot be true, that the church has an indispensable role in salvation, the role of upholding and defending the truth. John 8.32 says, Know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Well, if you can't know the truth with certainty, how can you be set free? So the church has a very important role in setting people free. Now, maybe you haven't established this principle very clearly and solidly in the mind of your questioner or the person you're talking to, 
but you have given them pretty good reasons or a pretty good reason from Scripture for why it is firmly established in your mind. And that is very important. But what if? What if? They know the correct answer to your question. For a Christian, what is the pillar and bulwark of the truth? They know that the answer from Scripture is the church. Then you simply say as you did in the previous case. Well, if the church is the upholder and defender of truth, then aren't we as Catholics right to listen to the church in matters of faith and morals? By establishing these principles with your question about the Trinity and about 1 Timothy 3.15, you quite often wreck havoc with this particular person's plan to pick off another sitting duck Catholic. And that's exactly what we are when we don't investigate our faith when we don't come to a greater and deeper understanding of the truth of Jesus Christ, we are sitting ducks for anyone who wants to come along and show us what the Bible really says. That's why so many Catholics leave this beautiful and wondrous thing we call a Catholic church, because they don't know their faith. Hopefully, that will start changing rapidly. And by asking these questions, by establishing these Catholic principles, you have now established that this Catholic isn't going to wilt when someone starts talking about Scripture. You're not going to hunker down in your bunker and let someone toss grenades in over the walls as they please. Oh no, oh no. You have some questions of your own. And you want some answers. And the next question you want to ask before they fully recover from 1 Timothy 3.15, is why do you believe that the Bible is the sole rule of faith for Christians? Where in the Bible does it say that? After all, if you believe in the Bible alone as the sole rule of faith for Christians, then the Bible ought to say that, don't you think? But you know what? Nowhere. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that the Bible should be used as the Christian's sole rule of faith. Nowhere. It ain't there. However, when you ask someone that question, you will get an answer. More than likely, the person you're talking to will turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. These verses say, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. When they read that to you, say, Amen. As a Catholic, I believe 100% what that verse is saying. Another quick principle here, a rule. Whenever someone reads you a scripture verse as a Catholic, your response should be, Amen. I believe that 100%. But you don't necessarily agree with their interpretation of that passage. Now, back to 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Notice two things about this passage. Number one, it says Scripture is profitable. It doesn't say Scripture is sufficient. In other words, it does not say that all we need to know about our faith is in the Bible. And number two, nowhere do we see the word alone, as in Scripture alone. What this passage is saying, and all this passage is saying, is that all of Scripture is inspired and profitable. As Catholics, we agree. Again, with every passage of Scripture, when interpreted in its proper context, we as Catholics agree. Scripture is inspired and profitable. We need to read Scripture. We need to know it. We need to ponder it, soak in it, meditate on it, pray it, and be able to share it. But this passage still doesn't say Scripture is the sole rule of faith for Christians. People try to make this Scripture verse say something that it doesn't actually say. Another principle, another principle, whenever someone puts a scripture verse in front of you which proves the Catholic Church's teaching is wrong, 
Make sure that you do at least these two things. Number one, read the verse very carefully. Very carefully. Because it probably doesn't say what they are trying to make it say. Number two, make sure you put that particular verse in context. You can usually do this by reading the three or four verses in front of it and the three or four verses behind it. Sometimes you have to read more. And sometimes with, say, Romans chapters 9, 10 in there, it's Paul's writings, it is deep stuff. And it's hard to understand no matter how many passages of Scripture you read. But normally, when you take a verse, read the passages before it and behind it to put it in better context. Because these verses that prove, verses that prove the Catholic Church is wrong on some doctrine or another are always, always taken out of context. In other words, they are misinterpreted. For example, the verses we're looking at, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which we just discussed, is often being used by non-Catholics to try to prove the doctrine of sola scriptura. When you put it in context, Go back just one verse and read 2 Timothy 3.15. Here Paul says to Timothy, And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The sacred writings that Timothy has known from childhood... Now, even though Timothy was a relatively young man, few, if any, of the books of the New Testament had been written when Timothy was a child. Paul is talking here about the Old Testament. What Paul seems to be saying is that the Old Testament is sufficient as a rule of faith because he is talking about the Old Testament here, not the New Testament. Most of the New Testament had not been written. It would seem to be saying more than any Protestant would want to admit to. Instead of the Bible alone, it seems to be saying that the Old Testament alone is the sole rule of faith for Christians, if you interpret it in that vein. Another Bible verse you might hear in an attempt to prove that sola scriptura is in the Bible is John 20, 31, which says, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's John 20, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe. Why does John 20, 31 not support the doctrine of sola scriptura? That's my question to you. And how can it actually be used to contradict the doctrine of sola scriptura? Remember the two rules. Read the verse carefully. Put it in context. There might be one or two more passages a person would turn to in trying to prove the doctrine of sola scriptura is in the Bible, but these are the two most common that I've come across. But careful examination of the passages in context show that these in no way support the doctrine of sola scriptura or the Bible alone. In fact, as I just showed in, with 2 Timothy 3.15, these passages can actually be used to argue against the doctrine of sola scriptura when interpreted as most fundamentalists and evangelicals interpret them. So what it all boils down to is that script, sola scriptura is not scriptural. It's not in the Bible. One of the two main pillars of Protestant doctrine simply does not hold scriptural water. You've now established a Catholic principle which in the long run, the long run, helps non-Catholics come to the truth. They more than likely won't agree with anything you are saying, but they have had to stop and think. You've shown them that there are chinks in their biblical armor, not for the purpose of winning an argument, but rather for the purpose of possibly, just maybe, opening minds to the truth. And remember, this being open to the truths of the Catholic faith probably will not happen immediately. It's a process, a process which requires prayer on your part and theirs. They have to be praying for openness to truth from the Father, from the Son, from the Holy Spirit. 
And they have to be praying for openness to the truth no matter where it may lead them. Now, again, what we've done is establish several very important Catholic principles. If the person you're talking to seems to be at least listening to what you've been saying so far, then you might want to push a little bit further. You might want to start trying to establish a very important Catholic doctrine. And that doctrine, which is in direct contradiction to Sola Scriptura, is the church's teaching that it's sacred scripture and and sacred tradition which make up the entire deposit of faith which comprise, comprises the rule of faith for Christians. As Catholics, we believe not that the scripture is the sole rule of faith, but that the word of God is the sole rule of faith. We believe in the word of God in its written and spoken form, not just in the written form. We believe in sacred scripture and sacred tradition. But as I said last week, the non-Catholic will want to see it in the Bible. Does the Bible back us up on what we believe? Well, let's see. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 15. Paul says to the Thessalonians, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth, or by letter. Traditions. Traditions taught by word of mouth, in other words, oral tradition, and traditions taught by letter, written tradition, sacred scripture, and sacred tradition. Now keep one finger there on Thessalonians because we're going to be coming back. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. It says the following, And what you have heard from me before many witnesses in trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Did Paul say what you have read in my writing pass on to others so that they may read it too? No. What you have heard from me in trust to faithful men who will write it down? No. Who will teach others. What we have here is an instance in Scripture of the passing on of oral tradition. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 says, I, Paul here talking, I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I have delivered them to you. The Corinthians are being commended by Paul because they maintain the traditions that he passed on to them. Sacred Scripture and Sacred Tradition. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. We also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. So they received as the word of God that which they heard, not simply that which they read in Scripture. And then lastly, in Acts 2, 42, we read that the first Christians were, quote, continuing, continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, or the apostles' teaching in some translations. And that's what sacred Scripture is. It's the apostles' doctrine or the apostles' teaching, as given to them by our Lord Jesus Christ. Very often the word tradition is almost like a curse word. They cringe when they hear it because they've been taught that Catholics believe in the traditions of men. And, as they rightly say, Jesus condemns the traditions of men in the Gospels. But, Jesus doesn't condemn all tradition. Nowhere does Scripture say such a thing. Jesus condemns the traditions of men, specifically the traditions of men which contradict or negate the word of God. He doesn't even condemn all traditions of men, but those that negate the word of God. Traditions in and of themselves are not bad things. It's when they negate the word of God that Jesus has a problem with them. 
But as we clearly just saw in several places in the New Testament, traditions that come from the apostles, and Paul, as he himself said, was an apostle, because the apostles were taught by Jesus and guided by the Holy Spirit, apostolic traditions are not condemned in Scripture. These traditions, these teachings, are considered, as we just saw in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, not the word of men, but the word of God. One last word about tradition. Every church, whether they want to admit it or not, every church has one or more traditions. Sunday as the Sabbath. Not in the Bible. Tradition. A tradition based on the authority of the Catholic Church. Wednesday night church meeting. It's not in the Bible. It's a tradition. Altar calls. But it is a tradition. And it's not in the Bible. Sola Scriptura. Not in the Bible. Tradition. And particularly a tradition of men. Which negates the word of God. Now, one last thing about this doctrine of Sola Scriptura. Let's look at it from a historical and logical point of view. When Martin Luther broke from the Catholic Church, it was about the year 1520. By the year 1600, there were more than 200 Protestant denominations. By the year 1900, the Protestant denominations numbered almost a thousand. And now in the year 1999, according to government statistics, they publish these things, there are between 25 and 30,000 Protestant denominations. And you know what? Each claims to be based on the Bible alone. And each claims to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Yet none of them have the exact same doctrines. And many, many of them have doctrines that absolutely contradict one another. Yet again, each one claims to be based on the Bible alone and each one claims to be guided by the Holy Spirit. How can that be? Can the Holy Spirit, which is supposed to lead us into all truth, can this same Holy Spirit lead different people into different doctrines? Doctrines that contradict each other. Can the Holy Spirit contradict itself? The answer, quite plainly, is no. The doctrine of Sola Scriptura has done nothing. You can get into a debate with a man who has 10 PhDs in theology, scripture study, whatever. I don't care. And if you take the church's side while he opposes it, you have nothing to fear. All right. I want to take a few minutes and give you some information in a few areas regarding the Bible and the Catholic Church that I think you should know about. First, have you ever thought about where the Bible came from? Most people don't. Many Protestants never do. Because you see the answer to the question of where the Bible came from is the Catholic Church. Now we all know that the books of the Old Testament were all written before Jesus was born. But the first book of the New Testament wasn't written until at least ten years or more after Jesus' death. So Christians got along without any of the New Testament None of it for at least 10 years after Jesus' death. And the last book of the New Testament wasn't written for at least 35 or 40 years or maybe more after the death of Christ. So Christians got along without a complete New Testament for at least 35 to 40 years or more after Jesus' death. How could they be saved if they didn't have the Bible and the Bible alone is the sole rule of faith for Christians? Also, several books that we currently have in the New Testament were not considered inspired scripture by all Christians everywhere. Revelation was a disputed book, as was Hebrews, as were 2 John and 3 John, Jude, and a few others. And there were many books, many other books in the New Testament, not in the New Testament as we have it, which were considered inspired scripture by various Christian communities. These included the letter of Clement to the Corinthians, the Didache, the letter of Barnabas, the Acts of Peter, the Acts of Paul, the Acts of John, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Apocalypse of Paul, 
and many, many, many others. So given this situation in the first few hundred years of Christianity, how did we get the Bible as we have it today? Who decided which books were and which books were not the inspired word of God? The Catholic Church. The bishops of the Catholic Church in North Africa in the year 393 A.D. got together in a town called Hippo. They approved the first list of the canon as we have it today, New Testament and Old. The canon is simply the list of the books in the Bible, the, the table of contents, if you will. The decision of the Council of Hippo was ratified by another council of North African bishops in Carthage in 397 A.D. The decision of that council was approved by the Pope in Rome, and from that time forward, the, di the disputes about what should and should not be in the Bible, for all practical purposes, ended until Martin Luther came along some 1,100 years later. So for 1,100 years, no disputes as to what is and is not the inspired Word of God based on the authority of the Catholic Church. So you need to realize that the authority of the Bible is based upon, is dependent upon the authority of the church. And what church would that be? Well, the only Christian church in existence at the time, and the only church that was calling councils together to decide such things at the time, the Catholic Church. The Bible did not just drop down out of the sky. It did not just come together because the Holy Spirit told all Christians everywhere what books were and were not inspired. Historical evidence, evidence says otherwise. Our assurance that the Bible is the Word of God, the inerrant Word of God, is based on the authority of the Catholic Church to decide such matters. But let's, let's ask the question, what authority does the Church have? The answer, it has apostolic authority which is, in truth, the authority of Jesus Christ himself as handed on to the apostles. One holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I could talk for hours on apostolic authority, and I have in the past, but I don't have the time tonight. So, in abbreviated fashion, let me set up a few principles for you and give you some scripture to go with them. Principle number one, Jesus founded one church, as in between zero and two. <laughs> he founded one church, not 25,000 churches. If you turn to Matthew 16, verse 18, and when I talk about the Pope, this passage will play a very important role. But in Matthew 16, verse 18, Matthew 16, 18 says the following, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my... Churches? <laughs> church! Jesus did not say churches. He said church, one. Principle number two, the one church founded by Jesus is authoritative. We've already talked about that from 1 Timothy 3.15, about the church as the pillar and bulwark or the upholder and defender of the truth. How can it uphold and defend truth if it doesn't have authority? And in Matthew 18, 15 through 17, we see an authoritative church as the final arbiter in disputes between Christians. It says that if someone refuses to listen even to the church, then they are to be treated as Gentiles and tax collectors. In other words, tossed out. The church was the final authority for Christians. Principle number three, the church is called to show forth a visible unity. Yet in John 17, 11, Jesus prays to the Father that we, his followers, Christians, may be one even as he and the Father are one. That we may be one as he and the Father are one. Do God the Father and God the Son disagree on doctrine? I don't think so. The Father doesn't say, yeah, we should baptize infants, and the Son says, no, Dad, you got it wrong. <laughs> they are one. 
They believe the same thing about matters of faith and morals. As Christians, we should do also. In John 10, 16, so there shall be one flock, one shepherd, not five flocks, not 10 or 100 flocks, and not 25,000 flocks. Ephesians 4, verses 4 and 5, there is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one, 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 one. John 17, 21, that they may all be one so that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And right after that, John 17, verse 23, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that thou hast sent me. Obviously, the unity Christ speaks of cannot be an abstract unity, an invisible unity. It has to be a unity the world can see if the world is to know and believe that the Father sent the Son. The world can't believe what it doesn't see. And again, from Matthew 18, 15 through 17, the church has to be visible if Christians are going to take their differences to the church for judgment. The church is visible, it's authoritative. Principle number four, the authority of the church is apostolic. In Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19, Jesus tells the apostles, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And in John 20, verse 21, it says, Jesus said to them again, he's talking to the apostles on the night of his resurrection, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, and remember, that's with all authority in heaven and earth. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, and he sends the apostles out with the same authority. In Luke 10, verse 16, Jesus says, He who hears you, hears me. And he who rejects you, rejects me. He's talking to his disciples, to the apostles. Pretty powerful words from the mouth of our Lord. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. Why? Because they have been given the authority of Christ. So Jesus gives his authority, all authority in heaven and on earth to the apostles. And what do the apostles do with it? They pass it on. Apostolic succession. We see in Acts chapter 1, verses 15 through 26, the first thing the apostles do after Jesus has ascended into heaven. Peter brings up the necessity of replacing Judas, of filling Judas's office as an apostle. The office holder has died, but the office remains to be filled. We see it in Paul's letters to Timothy and Titus where he talks about the role of the bishop and of passing on the true faith to trustworthy men who will then pass it on to others. And there are several scriptures in your booklets about this from Timothy and Titus. And that is exactly what has happened down to our very day. The bishops are the direct successors of the apostles with the Pope the Bishop of Rome being the direct successor of St. Peter. No human institution has ever lasted that long. It is only by the guidance and protection of God that the Catholic Church has withstood a 2,000 year test of time and that the institution of the papacy still exists. He who hears you hears me and he who rejects you rejects me. Now, I'll stop there for now on the issue of authority. I'll come back to it in just a minute. But right now, I want to cover very quickly a few more topics related to the church and the Bible. As I said a minute, ago, a minute ago, there were no disputes as to the canon of the Scripture, the list of books in Scripture, for over 1,100 years between the Council of Carthage and the time of Martin Luther's break from the Catholic Church. So what happened when Martin Luther came on the scene? We often hear that the Catholic Church added books to the Bible because we have seven more books in the Old Testament than do the Protestants. 
Those seven books being Sirach, Tobit, Wisdom, Judith, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, and Baruch. Well, we did not add any books to the Bible. They were in there, and Martin Luther took them out. And in his first edition of his, his German translation of the Bible, he also took out the book of James, the book of Revelation, and a couple of others. Why? Because they did not fit his theology. He eventually added those books back at the pleading of his fellow Protestant leaders. But he also added a word, at least one word, to the book of Romans to make it say what he wanted it to say. I think it's Romans 3.28. He added the word alone to make it say faith alone. So instead of the Catholic Church adding to Scripture, it was Martin Luther adding to and taking away from Scripture. And as the book of Revelation says, if you turn to the very back of your Bible, some of the last verses of Scripture, Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. In Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, we find that if anyone adds to or takes away from this book, which many Protestants will interpret as the entire Bible, then they are in a whole lot of trouble. If any pope had ever taught as an article of faith, as Martin Luther did, that several books of the New Testament should be removed from the Bible, even if he changed his mind a year or so later, as Martin Luther did, Catholics would never hear the end of it as proof that the Catholic Church is not of God. And you know what? It would be proof of just that if the Pope had taught that as an article of faith. But no Pope ever did. Martin Luther did. Yet the founder, the spiritual father of all of Protestantism, did this very thing. He added to and took away from Scripture. This is historical fact. Yet almost all view him as a hero. Ask them why. By whose authority did he do these things? Authority is very, very important. Did the Catholic Church ever burn Bibles? You bet we did. But so did many of the Protestant churches. You know why? Because there were many Bibles printed that were riddled with errors. So guess what? They were burned by Catholic and Protestant. One in particular was called the Murderer's Bible. Because there was a passage, I can't think of it now, it was something about feeding the children or the people, but it says, first fill the children. Well, in the murderer's Bible, it says, first kill the children. That Bible was burned. That Bible was burned. As were many others. Some Bibles were printed that are reputed to have had thousands and thousands of translation errors. We burned them, Yes. That's partially true. But we didn't burn the authentic Word of God. Did the Catholic Church chain Bibles? Yes, but not to keep people from reading them. It chained Bibles to keep them from being stolen, which allowed them to be available to everyone who could read, which at that time was a small percentage of the people. Before the printing press was developed, Bibles were copied by hand. Some of them, if you've ever seen old scriptures, Beautiful illustrations, some with gold leaf on every page and some encrusted with jewels on the covers. They were expensive. By our standards today, they would cost maybe tens of thousands of dollars. So, of course, the church chained them. You think some people might have stolen them if they had had the opportunity? The church chained them to keep them from being stolen so that they would be available to everyone, not just the rich. Think about it. If you had to pay $10,000, $20,000 for a Bible today, if a church down the street, Baptist church, Methodist church, whatever church, if they had to pay $20,000 for a Bible, do you think they would leave it out on the front step so that anybody coming by could read it? Uh-uh. That Bible would be gone in a heartbeat. So yes, we chain the Bible to make it available to everyone. Authority is the core issue, bar none. 
You can talk about Mary, about the Pope, about purgatory, but underlying all of that is the issue of authority. So we need to understand the nature of authority in the church and how it works. If we reject the authority of the church when it teaches on matters of faith or morals, we need to understand exactly whose authority it is we're rejecting. You can get into a debate with a man who has 10 PhDs in theology, scripture study, whatever, I don't care. And if you take the church's side while he opposes it, you have nothing to fear. And when you have no fear, you will share Jesus Christ with more and more people and plant the seeds for winning more and more souls for Christ. Because when you are on the side of the church, you are on the side of truth. So go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with confidence, not because of yourselves, but because of Jesus Christ and his body, the church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church.